Welcome to Recently Logged, where this week we become a Maurice fan cast. Harvey's <laughs> breaking things right before we start. Um, hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, it is us. We're back. We are back. For, I am Robbie. And I'm Micah. And together we form Recently Logged. And we're and we're back talking about the Planet of the Apes trilogy. Yes. The, the newer Planet of the Apes. The <laughs> newest. I was about to say, I, don't, I think this is the only one that's a trilogy out of like all of the Planet of the Apes movies. I mean, technically you could grab a trilogy from like the 60s one. Yeah. Because there are five of them. So you, could just, be so like, many? you could just be like, we have a trilogy. Because it was a, pro- a profitable <laughs> movie and they just make more they're just of making, profitable. Why are they making so many? <laughs> How many how uh, many apes are there? But this week we're talking about Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Indeed we are. Which is the second one after Rise of the Planet it's of so the Apes. So weird. The naming's so weird. I mean I feel I feel like everyone who has looked into these movies at all. Again, I still think my argu- I think confused. my argument is pretty good for their naming <laughs> though cuz like Rise is the rise of the fact that they're super intelligent apes at all and <laughs> Dawn is like the actual dawn of the idea that the planet is the planet of the apes. I see. And you think war will be them claiming the planet, Mike, or do you think they'll die? And who knows? Oh yeah, I, <laughs> sure they're gonna die after all of this. I they, don't know. They better they better claim the planet. I don't I don't know what's gonna happen in war. Right, we haven't we still haven't watched war yet, guys. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're talking about Dawn. Uh, when, uh, the second time we're talking about a Matt Reeves movie on the podcast. Matt Reeves. So. That should be have fun. we not talked about Cloverfield? Before? We have not done an episode on Cloverfield. Oh, I mean, I'm sure we've mentioned Cloverfield before. We're we're both big fans. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, do we want to get into the basic facts? Yeah, let's tell let's tell the people what they need to know. All right. So, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is a 2014 movie rated PG-13. Well, it is two hours and ten minutes. Are they allowed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, its little IMDb description is a growing nation of genetically evolved apes led by Caesar is threatened by a band of human survivors of the devastating virus unleashed a decade earlier. What if it was just like, they don't explain, they have no context really. What if it was just like Julius Caesar? <laughs> they Julius. Were, all the super intelligent apes were just being led by Julius Caesar. <laughs> be that, that would actually be pretty yeah. good. Uh, it was nominated for one Oscar. I, I don't know what it lost to because it, obviously it was nominated for visual effects. Like, yeah. But I'm pretty sure Rise won visual effects, but I'm hmm. not sure what this lost to. Uh, its cast consists of Gary Oldman, nice. uh, Ke- Carrie, Carrie, Carrie yeah. Russell, yeah. Andy Serkis, nice. Cody Smith McPhee, nice. Jason Clark, weird guy, <laughs> Toby Keppel, he's pretty good at this though, <laughs> and Kirk. <laughs> I, I went too far. <laughs> this guy's not important. Kirk. Agvito? Agvito. I'm assuming. Something like that. I'm so sorry. Uh, Directed by Matt Reeves, written by Mark Bombach, which I which I don't think is No, uh Noah Bombach's name is spelled. Well no no, not I wasn't saying Noah uh, Bombach. Bombach. I was saying I don't think that's the guy who wrote Rise, which it is not. No, no. Uh, and is based on the the character in the book uh by Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver. There you go. <laughs> that was very I informative. Thought, I, thought, I thought you were checking on what what it lost its Oscar to. <laughs> oh, was I supposed to? I thought that <laughs> you grabbed your phone right as I was mentioning that, and I was um, I was looking, I was waiting. Twenty fifteen Oscars. Twenty. Yeah, I always the Oscars it's are so, so weird, confusing, right? Um, let's see. Uh. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, we getting there? Um, winners and nominees. Let's Awards. See. That's. Let's see. Oh, J.K. Simmons. Hey. Best picture, best, best picture. director. Birdman was that year. Yeah, man. <laughs> okay, uh, here we go. Oh, interesting. According to this, the film takes place in 2026. <laughs> so we have that to look forward to. Nice. <laughs> um. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Here we go. Did you find it? 
No. Oh. <laughs> the orangutan that is featured pr- uh, prominently in the film is named Maurice. This is a reference <laughs> yeah. to Maurice Evans, who portrayed the orangutan Dr. Zayas in Planet of the Apes 1968 and Beneath the Planet of the Apes 1970. Okay, I actually, I, I'm very much glad that uh, Interstellar won that year. That was the, oh, <laughs> that's what it was up okay. against. <laughs> okay, that's a bit cheap. <laughs> right. It deserved it. Yeah, no, Interstellar should has, have won. But, but this, this has <laughs> fantastic visuals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> um, any, any, any other big things <laughs> takes place in 2026? <laughs> Specifically? Uh, <laughs> Who knew? Apparently, Koba has the Koba's name comes from uh, Stalin's nickname. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> I had no idea. This is very interesting. <laughs> oh my god! You're just gonna browse the IMDb trivia? No, I mean, I, who knew? Who, who knew all of this? All of this, uh, you know. Naming history is I mean, there. We mentioned that it was a Maurice fan cast, so I mean, I'm, I'll happily learn more there, there about you, Maurice. There you go. According to this, this is scientifically inaccurate because technically the species of ape that uh, Koba is is historically extremely less violent than just normal, <laughs> <laughs> normal uh, chimps. <laughs> it's a little funny, actually. <laughs> No, that's not okay. Sorry, we're way off track. This is not an interesting <laughs> podcast at the moment. I'm just. I thought Robbie was gonna say something. Oh, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, this can't be true. Never, though. As, never assume. During the ape attack on a human settlement, a large gorilla throws a burning barrel. This is a homage to the video oh game series God. Donkey Kong. I think they made that up. I, people are making that up, <laughs> but, but it, it does happen. Michael. But yeah, it does happen. Let's let's move on <laughs> let's, though. Let's talk about the actual movie. Arby's, we have the meats. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't for know, those who don't uh, know. For, I forget what off comment Robbie had one time in, in an episode in a season prior. I'm pretty sure. I think season two uh, or something. He he called. <laughs> Our main discussion, the meat. It's the meat of the podcast. Uh, and we have named it the meat as the segment and recording ever since. So that's what the that's what the we have the meats is wow. for. Well, uh, here we are. We're finally talking about what we think of the movie instead of just random Donkey Kong facts. <laughs> uh, so, Ravi, what do you think of the movie? Um, I think, personally. personally. Uh, first off, as a sequel to Rise, I think it does a, a lot... A lot of good for the for the franchise jump, on the whole. We jump ten years. I was about to say very big time jump, but a lot of the characters uh, feel very naturally matured, and the world feels very fleshed out. It's it's good stuff. It's a good sequel. Um, a lot of the emotional through lines of the first movie carry over very well, especially for Caesar's character in this. Um, Koba's good. I don't know. Uh, g- good sequel, I should say, first off. Um, VFX look even better than the first one, I would argue. Much better. The models, opinion. the models, oof. The models are at <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> Literally, there's... Uh, you, could there's reach a, you could reach out and touch Marie. <laughs> there's a couple of scenes where I'm like, how is that not, like, real hair? I, right. <laughs> what's going on? Oh my on? gosh, it's so good. Um, but yeah, VFX, great stuff. Uh, it, honestly, if not for Interstellar's existence, I would, have been, me, me, me. I would have been very upset for this uh, not winning uh, VFX, because it does look very good. We made a realistic black hole way before anybody else knew. <laughs> wow. Me, 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 me. <laughs> um, but yeah, what else to mention? Um, I think, honestly, I, I think this is much better than the first one. I might have mentioned that already, but... I think it handles its emotional story a lot better with a lot more subtlety and care than the first one does. Uh, even though I'm not a huge fan of the general conflict, I'm a fan of how it plays out, I think. I think they do a good job with all of the character writing and stuff for the human characters and uh, all the ape characters, too. It's, it's a solid screenplay, at the very least. Um, there's some great performances. Andy Serkis is even better here than he is in the first one. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a solid movie. What did you, what did you rate it? I gave it a four and a half out of five. I I liked it a lot. Mm. (laughs) Uh, yeah. So 
as for me, ditto on a lot of the points. I yeah. do think this time around, I probably agree that I that I think it's maybe better than the first one mm-hmm. because a lot of the things that really bothered me about the plot weren't <laughs> as big. Yeah. On a rewatch, um, I think I think really where this shines and where I wish we had more of was a lot like what was is <laughs> a lot of the like like the inner ape conflict stuff that happens a lot of the character beats and emotions that are conveyed with characters that can barely talk right is insane and again just carrying over from the first one you have that insane sense of brotherhood with the apes that like i don't know how they made how does it happen like, it's insane you're like the, the comrades um and with that it makes for a really really cool story with like koba especially because obviously koba is foreshadowed as a villain in the yeah. first one um but it makes for such an interesting progression of all of the characters again with the time jump that they've all matured so much and work together and all trust Caesar, like the way that Caesar is treated as a leader works for a very, very interesting story to play out. Um, and I really, really, again, like the VFX, the action is really great. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly wish there was less humans in this movie, <laughs> like like less human screen time. I don't need any of that. That VFX budget, Micah, it's grinded down. <laughs> um, but the human stuff is fine. It's probably my least favorite part of the whole movie, but it, just in how it contributes to the conflict and everything. Uh, but it still works really well. And I, I think my biggest problem with the movie overall is I wish it was just all around tighter. Uh, but I gave it four stars. Fair enough. <laughs> Ooh, also the score is amazing oh yeah michael giacchino my i was man. i was noting that this time i was like <laughs> i was like listening to the score a lot um but do you have any questions to to dive us deeper um i had thought of something and now now you made me forget Micah. you put me on the spot <laughs> um i guess uh kick us off tradition we'll do uh favorite scene or sequence in the movie Ooh. which there are, there are quite a few really good ones here yeah see almost every single <laughs> one of my favorite scene or sequences are like um a coba caesar moment um coba caesar <laughs> hashtag coba caesar right moment. yeah i'm like what's going on here <laughs> <laughs> it's morbid time wow um no but like again i really think where this movie shines is almost in, like and it's almost um almost Shakespearean style Mm -hmm. feel of its like betrayal and setup with Coba and Caesar. Um, And there are just so many really good scenes. One of my favorites uh, overall is when uh, Coba goes like all the scenes with Coba with the gun testing people. Those are really Um, good. And dude, it's just so unnerving to watch him, to watch him do what he does (laughs) and everything. Like Coba is a really commanding presence. Um, but man, just so many things like the Koba and Caesar fight is really good. Mm-hmm. See, like, I, I don't even know, man. <laughs> like, um, the, the scene where Caesar gets shot is really good. Yeah. I was, I was actually going to mention, uh, basically all of my favorite scenes are, uh, just like the ape scene. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, I was specifically, I think if I were to just like pluck one out i think i would go with the opening sequence mm. uh with all the village stuff it's, the opening sequence very is nice really good it, it's kind of understated how uh just kind of serene this movie is a lot of the time yeah we were we were originally <laughs> actually going to try and get some some like rainy forest ambience going but we couldn't get the mix to sound good yeah yeah um but like we did that because specifically one thing that always kind of carries through in this movie is it's like pleasant green color and always kind of a rainy forest sound. Yeah. Like like when you're in the forest and not in the city where the war happens at the end of this, like it, it is very like, uh, like again, serene and almost peaceful. And mm-hmm. like in the opening, just watching them, even though they're set up as a very strong, threatening presence with the score and the opening shot and everything, and yeah. everything that it establishes, it, it also really shows how much, like, I don't know. It's a very peaceful movie. Peace there is yeah, over everything. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> the calm before the storm, if you will. Good stuff. 
Michael Giacchino is so good. <laughs> Dude, that, that like string rise as it pans out from Caesar's eyes as the opening <laughs> shot. What is happening? <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, no, I, I think that would be my favorite no, scene. No, that's really that's good. good stuff. <laughs> um, man, I, I completely <laughs> blanked. Out. I had a question. We should, we should not have. The, this is the thing that always happens when we do. Like, we record an episode right after we watch right, the movie. We finished, we're, just kinda, we're just kind of sitting there. We're like, yeah. We're trying to, like, <laughs> completely process the movie in our minds to come up with good questions. Uh, I had a question. Uh but I kind of lost. What do you think of? Oh, so I'll just like I'll just yeah, go yeah. with something. What do you think of uh, Gary Oldman's character? Gary and the Oldman. use of the use of Dreyfus in the colony. Um, I don't know. I it's it's interesting because I I think the colony is kind of I, it's written as well as I would expect it to be. <laughs> you know, like wow. it's I don't know. They I, I don't really know how I feel about it because like it's good. Sure, but it's not like I I would never have remembered that his name was Dreyfus, you know? <laughs> like but it but it doesn't really matter all that much. Yeah. Know? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it I feel like again watching it the first time it felt like it played such a bigger part in the story. Um when you when really uh, it's used kind of, of just as a as a kickoff point. Yeah, it's kind of there as like a resource for Koba to be able to turn around and do yeah, everything. Yeah. But I really don't like. It's not that I don't like it. It's not that I don't <laughs> like this part of the movie. But I don't think they handled a lot of that as well as they could, especially when Koba takes over the humans, um, and like locks them in cages. Fair and enough, like yeah. I, feel, I, 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 like both times watching that, I was like, it feels kind of like it's not explored at all. And like, obviously Koba the entire time was being like very selfish and moving towards his goals. And it's very yeah. natural for the character to want to do something like this to the humans. Again, he was treated the worst out of any of them. Yeah. Uh, and Harbor in Har harbors, harbors, those feelings, yes. the entire movie. Um, but at the same time, I feel like, I guess, it just spends more time focused on the characters than the plot in that section, which I guess is good, <laughs> but I, I don't know. Yeah, no, it does feel a little weird around, like, breaking into the third act. Yeah. That's the that's the only time, really, throughout this entire movie where it feels like it's going through the motions. Yeah, and, like, even, even the war itself, like, you have blue eyes mm -hmm. being like, oh, it's terrible, the <laughs> war, and then it's just over. <laughs> um, yeah. Which, you know, it's again, it's good action, and but, like, the actual weight of the fight and everything, I feel like, isn't very well expressed. Because there's a lot of apes, but there's not that many apes. <laughs> and it looks like there was a lot dying in that, in that right. fight. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know, it's really weird. And even the, the killing of Ash felt like so... Like, Blue Eyes seemed like the only one who was allowed to be, like, upset about it. Like, where was Rocket? Yeah, no, it's. <laughs> I I think that's actually a pretty good point because I was I was trying to pinpoint exactly like why I didn't want to give it like a full five, but honestly, I think it is the end of the second act leading up to like the final fight and everything. It it feels a little, uh, I don't know, like half baked. I guess I'll, I'll like all it, the all I'll the ideas like are there. I'll put it like this, this is, this is kind of how I'm forming it in my mind okay. here. So like <laughs> my my example of kind of comparing the idea of a play similar, I mean the movie similar to a Shakespeare play. Uh -huh. It's like that, and it's very complex. It has a lot of emotional characters and everything, but when it starts to get to that split into the third act, it kind of drops some of its complexity. Because I feel like it didn't know how to execute it fully and getting all of the stuff that needed to happen. Yeah. Dropped. So it kind of chops everything just down to Caesar and Koba. Yeah, I could see that, definitely. Because there's a lot of characters that I care about. <laughs> there's a lot of characters. Um, again, like Rocket. Like, Ash just gets killed and, like, we don't even see Rocket's reaction. Because he's, yeah. like, when does he find out <laughs> what, what happens, you know? Yeah. Um. And just in general, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that I'm sad wasn't spent more time on and stuff like that. Like um, even Caesar's family, like Caesar's Caesar's got a wife. <laughs> Blue right. eyes is there a lot, obviously, but like he's got a new child and a wife, and a lot of the stuff feels like it's just kind of 
asking to be explored more. Yeah. But not allowing the characters to fully get that, which again is why I said at the beginning when we were watching the movie, I was like, man, I could just take like hours <laughs> of just the ape villain. Michael Michael wants the four hour Shakespeare cut of this movie, I do, apparently. I do. <laughs> Give me that. That would be pretty good. I, I'm not I'm not even gonna lie. That would be, yeah, I would go watch that. <laughs> Full on betrayal uh <laughs> long play. I'm hoping war will uh kind of help a a lot of the ending of this movie feel a bit better in retrospect. Well, see, here's the thing about that, though, and I was actually going to ask you about Mm -hmm. this, too, how you felt about the progression of Caesar's character, because I feel like the one thing that's really strong in this movie especially is, like you said, the building of Caesar as a character. Mm -hmm. And I think watching him progress through this entire movie is a really natural, like, midpoint for his character. Right. Yeah. Over the entire series. Obviously, he's had other character arcs, but, like, the big swooping, the story is about Caesar for all three movie arc. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um... And he's he's a really fun character to watch in this movie. Right. I was about to say, going from the first one to this one is is a lot of fun. Just because uh, him as a, like a character, he's matured so much from the first one. Yeah, and just like the commanding power, like power and presence he has as a leader, and the respect all of like everybody mm-hmm. else shows him, even even Koba. <laughs> um, the old Andy Circus is really crazy. Yeah, and dude. When when <laughs> Caesar just straight up like wastes him in the initial fight. <laughs> My goodness, dude, <laughs> it's insane. Again, I think the only reason Caesar was struggling so much in the end fight is because he had just been shot. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but um, good stuff, man. Do you have a, Do you have another question? Because I think I have another question, but I don't know. Um. Yeah. What do you think? How, how do you think it? How well do you think it handles uh, its kind of, uh, I was going to say B-plot, but it really, like, it kind of sticks with the humans most of the time um, when stuff is happening. Yeah. But I would Like, the human side of the yeah, plot? Yeah, I was about to say, what do, you, what do you think of how that's paced out and everything? So I was going to say, and this is actually something that I wanted to mention. Yeah. That, and, I, and I mentioned this to you while we were watching it. I think the use of the humans on an overall story level is neat. Yeah, exactly. Because, uh, and I, and again, I explained this to you, uh, the way that, you know, as us being humans, we see the humans <laughs> and we instantly want to connect and empathize with them. Yeah. That's just, that's natural. It's more natural to empathize, em- empathize with the real humans <laughs> than the fake CGI apes. <laughs> um, so what this does is it kind of puts you into a really cool place, even though you start out as being like on the ape side and everything, obviously. It puts you in a really unique place where you really want to trust the humans as well, like Caesar. <laughs> yeah. And you really want to believe that they can help because you've seen them and sympathize with them. They have kids. They have all of this. They want to survive. Um, and it puts you in a really unique place because uh, really Koba... Koba has every reason to feel the way he feels towards the humans, especially being that really, like, right outside where they are. They were amassing a giant arsenal. Right. <laughs> and that's the first thing he found. Like, what What else is he supposed to think? <laughs> they came in, they shot somebody, uh, and so on. So I think it's really interesting, the use of that, and then the use of, like, that justification for Koba's actual actions leading to his selfish motivation towards the end. I think all of that is really, really cool use of like humans as a thing to play off the apes. I was about to say from a, from a screenwriting perspective, I just think the way uh, they handle a lot of the human plot line and the way they uh, like, use it to parallel a lot of the stuff that happens in the ape village is is really good i just wanted to bring that up really yeah dude the the line uh <laughs> dude the line with uh blue eyes and, C- and caesar when they're talking about the humans uh-huh. and he's like it's my fault uh i keep thinking that apes are better than humans mm-hmm. that like that was that was a sick line man <laughs> that scene is so good it really is <laughs> um but basically, basically any scene where it's just like uh, Caesar talking to someone, it's usually really good. You're like, oh my gosh, Caesar. 
<laughs> You're so amazing. <laughs> Good old Andy Circus, my man. Right, Andy it Circus cannot cannot be understated. Andy Circus cannot be overstated. So is, how great he is in this. It's so insanely talented. What the heck? <laughs> Um, what do you think of, uh, Blue Eyes in this movie as a character? Um, I don't really know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about him, especially because it almost feels like he's just there to be like an emotional, uh, like anchor for, um, Caesar in this to an extent. Uh, and like, he's not really going to be like a full fledged character until the third one, uh, which I'm like, eh. But I don't know the stuff he's like the scenes he's in are good. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I just wish he had a bit more of a purpose to serve in this one. Again, if it was the four hour <laughs> cut, Blue Eyes could have gone full ham. I was about to say they they could have had like more stuff with him and Ash and um, and him and Coba. Yeah, and him and Coba. Like I don't know. I just wish he was a little more. He was given a bit more time in this than he is. Yeah, so so you have, um, and I was going to mention this too. You make me Whoa. think of all the things. Uh, you have like the, 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 it's not explicitly stated, but essentially like the council <laughs> of, of the apes. With, with You have Caesar, Koba, Rocket, and Maurice. Yeah. And those are like, Maurice. <laughs> those are like your four, your four mains. Uh, and then, Rocket has Ash as a son, mm -hmm. and Caesar has Blue Eyes. Yeah, and obviously Rocket and I mean not Rocket, Ash and Blue Eyes are really good friends. But like, we could have had more of that and seen more of that. And I also think that it plays into interesting. Like, I would have loved to see a lot more of like Maurice, Rocket, and Koba all showing their influence on Blue Eyes. Yeah, um, because obviously during that. I guess that's in the middle of the second act when Koba first like burns the village, shoots Caesar, all of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's supposed to be like they were like Koba and Blue Eyes were close as well. Yeah. So he's like connecting and manipulating Blue Eyes with this. Yeah. yeah. But that could have been like a much more powerful moment. Again, exactly. if we had more time yeah. with the four and the kids and just Michael, we're making the the same complaint as in our uh, Encanto episode. The characters are good. We just want to spend more time with them, please. <laughs> Dang it. It's the same it's the same it's just a sim very similar problem with this actually, which is a little weird. <laughs> right. Encanto and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes having similar issues. But yeah, no, I, I honestly, I, honestly, I, I'm not on I, I don't know if there are any other major problems than just those, like the pacing of the story around the end of the second act and uh, some shoddy character writing, which those actually play into each other a lot. Yeah. But honestly, I don't know. Yeah, it's, don't it's know. so good. Like the rest of it is so good. No, there are <laughs> there are a ton of really fantastic <laughs> elements in this. The cinematography too. Yeah, the I wanted to mention the cinematography and lighting and everything is insane. There are so many just like amazing shots in this movie. Right. Um, and again, they really set up. Um, and they do kind of that that Paul Thomas Anderson kind of thing. And I'll explain this <laughs> before you let. They do that kind of Paul Thomas Anderson thing in using the camera to really punctuate power structure. Yeah, definitely. Um, and kind of the switch of power structure throughout between Caesar and Koba. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's a that's an interesting observation, actually. Well, because the the first shot of the movie is an extremely commanding shot of mm -hmm. Caesar. Yeah. Um, and you have, again, like, uh, Koba being the one jumping into frame with yeah. the bear attack. Yeah. And, uh, and everything that happens with that. And as the movie kind of develops, I noticed, like, the shots will take that same kind of presence and put it on Koba more and more. And then again, by the end, you have Koba as the main focus and Caesar jumping into frame and everything again to, to fight for it. Back. We mentioned we mentioned the on screen presence of a lot of these performances and the cinematography does a lot of the heavy lifting there. Yeah, there's this like brief shot uh, towards the middle before like the big betrayal and everything mm -hmm. in the second act. Um of Koba sitting across in the fire while Caesar is giving oh, a speech. Oh yeah, that's such a good and shot. And it kind of it goes past and like <laughs> briefly rests on that kind of commanding shot on Koba, like with the fire and the heat like it's going good, over. Good stuff. And and then continues moving, and I'm like, ooh. <laughs> man, any t any time uh, 
characters are like moving in this movie though it, like it, this the, the cinematographer I, I didn't look and see who it was but they they really know how to like shoot movement as well like it, it's just really solid camera work all around really yeah no, i was about to say the camera work is kind of understated <laughs> how like genuinely good it is at punctuating these characters which is especially impressive on top of the fact that again they're not standing they're, there like they're, they're just like some goofy it's guys just, there it's just like a guy <laughs> in uh, a suit <laughs> michael sarson Ooh. Uh, Interesting. Cinematographer and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Okay, yeah, that makes <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> man, Prisoner of Azkaban, that's good cinematography, man. Good stuff. He directed a movie in the eighties. <laughs> oh, cool. Who knew? <laughs> I mean, I've, I evidently not me because I didn't really know who the guy was. But yeah, no. but no, the cinematography is very good. Um, and see my Paul Thomas Anderson <laughs> comparison wasn't that crazy. <laughs> wow, I suppose not. <laughs> um, do you? I, oh yeah, I was gonna mention another thing that I don't know. I'm not crazy about it. It's not a huge problem, and it it is not really. It takes place at the same time as the other problem that we had with it. Okay, but, like it's not the same thing. I just really am not a big fan of the colony and then the towers as set pieces. You know. Eh, that's fair. Yeah, I, 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 I could see where you're coming from. Just that they could be more interesting. Yeah, and like the tower, especially with like the C four thing with the humans, that didn't really have much yeah, weight. Yeah, no, it and didn't. it was it was like a really weird place. Why did the apes all go to the top of the tower? Yeah, why? <laughs> they were all just sitting up there. <laughs> yeah, no, like like I said, the ending of this movie is really good, but like a lot of the stuff like. Like I said, breaking into the third act is really weird <laughs> and kind of just like and I, the, the ideas are there, but it, it doesn't have the weight that it should. Yeah, I don't know. Like and like, again, with Gary Oldman's character, he's like willing to straight up blow himself up <laughs> right. to take out the apes <laughs> like for the protection of the human race, which which sounds like a very like. Should like it I guess, should like, be a very big character moment. Well, you know? yeah, like, but it sounds like a character moment coming from one of those characters that's like on edge. Like, oh, yeah, we gotta save the human right, do whatever it takes. Yeah, but Gary Oldman's character seems in this like a is, pretty is, rational is play, guy. Yeah, it's played as a very as like a pretty rational, pretty sympathetic guy. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, obviously he's willing to defend the humans, but like again, as human, we 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 get that we empathize with the human colony. Um, yeah. So it's like weird that like it feels like it's like this weird off side antagonist, but not actually antagonist moment. Yeah. If you would have told me um, back after I first watched it, like that there was like a C four thing at the end of this movie, I honestly like would have forgotten completely. You know, <laughs> like I would have been like, "What? What are you talking about?" Yeah. I don't know. It's really weird. And then it doesn't even take down the tower. Right. Yeah. It just like <laughs> it explodes. just hurts. A, it hurts a couple of the apes. Yeah. <laughs> and then Koba and Caesar continue fighting. Yeah. It felt like it was meant to be there to just like gives some closure for a lot of the human characters but it just i don't know it, it feels a little shoehorned in there yeah it doesn't, it doesn't work and, fully and on that topic um another one of the problems and i hate i hate that where, yeah i mean like this is what, I mean, what else what else is there to talk about like, like, like most of the elements everything are else fantastic. is like great yeah um but <laughs> that plays into another thing that i just thought about um the fact that you kind of have the humans, especially the one family, and their relationship with the apes building, mm -hmm. and that kind of background hope that maybe the apes and the humans can get along, but it's never focused on very much. And then that kind of end moment where Caesar is like, like the, the we started the war, nobody will ever forgive us for this. Yeah, you have to go, and they're like, I hoped we could. I thought like blah yeah. blah blah, all that. I felt like it was a very weird character beat. It is. No, it does feel weird. Like, it It seems like uh, they were just like, uh, we can't have them in the third movie, guys. <laughs> Get them out of here. Uh, and, like, the kid who, who got to know Maurice more doesn't even get anything. Like, like mm -hmm. the, the neither of them are there. They just drift away. <laughs> I don't even know where they go. So it's, like, a really weird conclusion when, again, like you said, the human characters actually get a lot of screen time. Even yeah. though they're not the most important thing going on, they they really are 
affecting the story and they have character beats with that are very important for the apes yeah yeah um so it's very weird (laughs) yeah it's just like like really honestly all of the problems that like aren't very noticeable throughout they just all kind of come to a head near the end of the movie um but all of the stuff that's like been really good throughout the movie also is very good at the end. It's it's, it's an yeah. odd it's an odd ending because a lot of like the character writing problems and the weird pacing and stuff like that. It it just I don't know I don't know why it comes out so prominently. I was, I was about to say the one thing that I really noticed too when we were watching it, even mm-hmm. towards the beginning, is that the pacing isn't like isn't bad, no. but like feels strangely unengaging sometimes yeah like even though interesting things are happening it feels like there needs to be almost more like more substance behind it i could see that i don't know areas i think i think it flowed a bit better re-watching it this this past time yeah i mean i I, this again ties in (laughs) i think i think my biggest complaint for the movie and i know it's it's not great to complain about just why didn't the movie have more of something (laughs) or something like that like complaining about something that isn't there not something that is yeah um but really i think for a lot of things to work better in this you needed more time with all of the apes to get more emotional complexity. Because again, even though they communicate really well and there's a strong sense of togetherness with them and Mm -hmm. you get a lot of emotion from them, um, with the fact that they are not human characters and do not communicate as easily, you do need a lot to keep you fully like with the weight of what the characters are supposed to have. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, and I don't think that's a huge issue, but I did notice that it felt like a little empty sometimes. Interesting. Only sometimes. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a that's a good observation. I don't know. I mean, uh, that that's uh, you pretty much summed up. Like, I, I don't know. I I didn't have that many problems with this movie. Oh, I don't have I don't have exactly quote unquote yeah. that many problems either. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you've you've kind of summed up all of the negative thoughts I have on it. Like, uh, most of the rest of the technical elements here are great most the rest of the character beats here are great really it's just the ones we've brought up are yeah feel kind of shaky at at worst i was about to say again the stuff that works well in this works insanely well and i don't think overall i i kind of agree that i don't think it's not with you but with (laughs) some other people that i've seen that i don't think it's inherently overall like with all of the elements together as strong over like uh, as a movie as the first one like i think the first one is just a a little bit more solid even I though guess. i rated them the same i guess um but i like this movie yeah like, what this movie is trying to do much more i would much rather watch this movie than the first one yeah so would i um and i think a lot of that plays into again a lot of the problems with the first one that we talked about last time yeah yeah and just the fact that the apes are just so so much fun to watch here mm-hmm yeah, I was about to say this is a much more ape heavy movie and they're just it's so good. When it, when it when this movie's good, it's so good. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, I I actually almost cried during this movie, man. I almost I almost cried like 3 times watching this. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> I, I I was almost in tears within the first like six minutes. I'm like, come on, <laughs> give me give me a chance here. <laughs> uh, it's no, it's really good. But yeah, do you have anything else we want to mention uh, before we kind of re- like? I mean, yeah, I mean, um, I I don't. There's not really any other major things. Really, just more praises for the lighting and stuff like that. Like the visuals alone, like you could watch this movie with the sound off and that's, that's saying a lot because Giacchino's score is really good here. And the sound design, as we mentioned, is amazing here. Yeah. You could watch this movie with no sound and still have like an insanely compelling uh, piece of action filmmaking. <laughs> it's and, good stuff. And I think you could, you could um <laughs> have like watch this movie with none of the subtitles for the eight mm-hmm. translation stuff and still have a really compelling character like stuff yeah even if they didn't like human talk as much i was about to say testament to the again the performances in this uh, the mocap stuff it's all great yeah really all of all of the visual storytelling elements from cinematography mm-hmm. lighting uh, motion capture acting yeah all like all of it comes together in a really really well really really impressive way yeah even like like 
honestly way beyond <laughs> the first movie. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's what I usually remember about this movie when I think back on it. So it's just really good. <laughs> I don't know. Maurice reads anime. I mean, manga in this movie. <laughs> Maurice. Maurice finds manga. <laughs> <laughs> the apes discover the terrors of war and also manga. <laughs> Good movie in my eye. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, I'm very curious on what they're going to do with the next one right? in terms of it being like them going full blown war. It's, it's very, be, like, yeah. It's good. It's got to handle. It. It's going to be a hard thing to handle. I really think it's got a lot stacked against it, it in does. terms of just being difficult to write. Um. But I'm very excited to see the end of the trilogy. I was about to say, it's, been, I just, it's been so good so I far. I just ordered the trilogy uh, in 4K so we can watch the we can watch the last one. <laughs> and I'm very excited. Um, yeah, no, I'm. It's very cool. I can't wait to see it. Hopefully, it won't. I really hope it's not one of those deals where like <laughs> they're like, oh, look how brutal this is. We're gonna destroy everything. Yeah, I hope it, I hope loves. it's not just like. Uh, brutal monkey war for like two hours because i don't know that'll, that'll probably get old pretty fast because yeah, so much of my favorite elements of these movies and this movie especially are like the smaller character moments mm -hmm. and kind of the grandness and just the emotional connection they have with each other exactly uh, and i really hope we don't like lose that good, in some sense good in movie manga a very good it's movie. a good movie <laughs> again i gave it four out of five stars I give it a four and a half um, and I guess that'll lead us into our next section of the podcast. Uh, so we now find ourselves, uh, ourselves. Selves. I mean, I cannot speak today. I think right. we got up too early. We um, did. <laughs> uh, we got up at like five. Oh man. I'm, uh, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> so we find ourselves <laughs> in the final uh, wow. segment in the, what we watched segment. And for those of you who are new to the podcast, uh, the What We Watched segment is a little thing at the end where we talk about all of the movies that we've watched since the last episode. Yeah. Just brief little ratings and opinions uh, <laughs> to where you can hear even more from us. Even more tidbits about films. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? And we talked about Avatar, Avatar. So we're going from, I guess, the 16th or yeah. the 15th. Well, I mean, like the afternoon of the 15th. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Um, so what did, hold on. Okay. So I watched, uh, that afternoon I watched by myself the 2022 film Fresh, which you may have heard of. It's a Hulu original, uh, directed by Mimi Cave. And it was quite good. I, I had been looking forward to it for a while and, uh, the performances were solid. Uh, the body horror was good. Uh, it, it took a lot of big stylistic swings and it actually hit pretty well. So I, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, also on the 16th. I gave it a 4 uh, out of 5. <laughs> <for you. laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> also on the 16th, I watched The In-Laws. The uh, In-Laws. I picked up the criterion for it at a, at a used uh, DVD. <laughs> no one's heard of this movie. Mike. I, I had never heard of this movie, but it had Peter Falk in it, so I thought I'd give it a try, and it was also cheap for a criterion. Um, and, it, you know, it was fine. It had a lot of really unique and fun <laughs> elements to it. But a lot of stuff that is kind of what you'd expect from a more, in my opinion, mediocre comedy. Like, just not Fair all enough, of the bits. Yeah. A lot of the bits felt kind of lazy. Some of the jokes didn't work. There were just some weird plot stuff. It didn't feel like it was going as hard as it could or being as funny as it could. Fair enough. Um, but the two leads are still really fun and play really well off of each other. And, like, yeah, overall, it was a really fun movie. Just, I mean, I, I watched a couple scenes from it. It seemed all right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? it's, it, it has this weird sense that it that it's funnier than it is, I mm, think. Yeah. Like, like when they come in at the end scene on, like, the air balloon thing, like, I was like, <laughs> what? That was pretty good, though. <laughs> uh, but I gave it three and a half. It was still very fun. There you go. Um, then we watched that night, I suppose, uh, the 2022 film that Sean Levy directed, if you can, if you can even <laughs> believe it, director of Free Guy and Night at the Museum, oddly enough, which I, <laughs> I don't know. I do like the Night at the Museum series. Yeah. But yes, we watched the Adam the Project. The Adam Project. Uh, hmm. Hmm. How do I feel about this movie? 
I like it. It's weird. Sean Levy <laughs> makes weird movies. He makes weird. It's such weird it's movies. Like <laughs> movies that are that are pretty objectively just fun. Yeah. Like he like this is this is not a bad movie. No. But at the same time, for me, there was something really like detestable and flat going on in the entire. Time, it is, which yeah. is the same way I felt towards Free Guy. Yes. Um, Free Guy more so. For Free me. Guy more so. Yeah. yeah. I think this is a bit more solid than Free Guy. Um, but man, <laughs> I, I I I I don't really want Sean Levy to work with Ryan Reynolds ever again. I can see Free Guy made him too powerful. I can see why a lot of people don't like this, but I don't know. I I think. It, it, removing myself from my biases against like just the general state of modern action movies and like sci-fi blockbusters if i remove myself from that uh and just my general distaste for the current landscape of those the, those kind of films I think it's a good film. I think I think it's solid. Yeah, I like it. I don't know. It's it's fine. I gave it, I gave it two and a half. <laughs> I gave it a three. And thinking a Thinking about giving it a three. Yeah. Because like there, it really isn't like, like there's nothing that bad. There. No, there's nothing terrible in it. I just don't like a lot of what it's doing. Yeah. Um, a lot of the a lot of the humor does not hit very well. No. <laughs> but that's to be expected, I suppose. Uh, I get yeah. I gave it a three and a half. I thought it was all right. Um, and then on the 17th, I watched the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the Netflix one. Uh, I'd never seen a single Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie in my life. And uh, everyone I know seems to not like this one very much. Um, but it's good. I thought it was great, even. Uh, I, I'm very inexperienced in slasher films, but uh, this had a lot of really fun kills. And it didn't skimp on, like going full-on horror almost the entire time so we're losing our audience i had a, i had a fun time they're unsubscribing fun time if stuff. i'd have gone and seen this in a theater i would have had an even better time it, it was really fun i don't know <laughs> the characters I, I saw a lot of people complaining about how like one dimensional and one note the characters are but i actually really liked them i don't know Maybe maybe I'm just weird. We're losing our entire audience. Okay, they're, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, away. 2022. Uh, I liked it a lot. I give it four. They've out turned. Of five. They've turned off the podcast. <laughs> also, found out uh, Elise Fisher and I have the same birthday. You didn't know that? Well, I th I think I found that out like on my birthday this past <laughs> year, but I had forgotten about it, and then I saw Elise Fisher in this again. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot we're like exactly one year apart. It's so weird. <laughs> it's bizarre. But I had a lot of fun good movie uh moving on <laughs> uh on the 18th uh well technically the night of the 17th but it was that late uh, yeah we watched paul blart mall cop what's, 2 what's this wee business me, uh, me and my mom my mom had never <laughs> seen it uh and i was like okay someone who's never seen paul blart mall cop 2 <laughs> uh, shocking really <laughs> um and yeah it's there's a lot to unpack in Paul Blart Mall Cop. It's too. true. It's true. You could you could do multiple essays on, on that movie. <laughs> it's not that good. I gave it one and a half. There are like a couple, like, like maybe two or three funny jokes in the entire uh, movie. Uh, sad times. It's it's like, really just. But not it's a that comedy. Funny. It's a comedy. Like <laughs> I think I think it's it's mostly enjoyable. Unfunny comedy. As in, like watching it ironically is, okay. is the most enjoyable way to watch it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but I gave it, again, one and a half. Uh, then on the 18th, uh, I watched High Flying Bird. High Flying Bird. Uh, very, very, very good movie. Solid film. Uh, one of my favorites. It's the High Flying Bird it's flying high... way up in the sky, Robbie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it's kind of understated uh, how different Soderbergh feels now. Like, like right. in recent films that I've seen of his compared to a lot of his older stuff. But it's got a really, really fun kind of style. And I don't know. I just, I really enjoyed this all around. It's, it's I mean, this was like the third time I watched it. But uh, I just, uh, man. I gave it a four and a half. I love, I love the energy that the, movie no, has. No, the performances and the screenplay <laughs> are so good. The screenplay is so good. <laughs> uh, then on the 19th, I watched Moonrise Kingdom. Moonrise Kingdom. Uh, I Every time I'm like, eh, Moonrise Kingdom's probably not that. It's actually good. probably pretty mid. And then I go and watch it, and I like, I love it every time. So I still gave it five stars. Wow. I am the criterion for it. And then after I watched a bunch of the supplements, and that was fun. Uh, nice. I logged to do like to read. Um, I didn't rate it, 
but <laughs> it's still but it's, it's, an, there. it's an interesting short. Um, Fair enough. There's also a cool short, and I wanted to check if it was on Letterboxd, but I don't think it was, that I didn't know was on the Criterion that was like is this little intro to the movie thing that I had never seen before. What would like a... Kind of like on Fantastic Mr. Fox, where someone's just like yeah, one of the, one of the characters the from the movie is introduced. Yeah, it's you. probably not like loggable yeah. or anything, but that's pretty cool. No, yeah, it's this entire thing where he's like, like it's uh, Jason Schwartzman's character yeah. playing the movie for a bunch of the <laughs> khaki scouts. That's funny. Yeah, that's pretty cool, though. But yeah, a very good movie. I very much enjoy it. I wish I liked it more. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, later, I guess, was that the yeah. same day? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we watched, we sat down with, uh, Micah's girlfriend and watched shout Matilda out, for the first time. <laughs> shout out to Haley. Shout out to Haley. Friend of the podcast. <laughs> friend uh, of, friend of mine, personally. Wow. Well, she brought, she brought her Matilda Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah. And we watched We'd it. We'd never seen it before. Directed by Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito. The first time seeing a Danny DeVito film. And yeah, it was it was fun. <laughs> Danny was, DeVito production. Like <laughs> it was it had a lot of Tim Burton energy, but it makes sense being that it was mostly Tim Burton like crew working on it. Yeah. Um, no, it makes sense. <laughs> but it's but it like I really like Roald Dahl's writing, and it's really cool to see somebody actually actually I can't speak <laughs> actually execute one of his movie like one of his m- movie adaptations well. Yeah, because it's so difficult absolutely. to pull off. Yeah, no, I have I used to like Matilda the book a lot as a kid. Um, I was a big Roald Dahl fan just in general. Um, but this is one of the most like book accurate adaptations I've seen of his that's actually good. <laughs> yeah, there's like there's like <laughs> the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, but that's not book. Accurate I was about to say it seems like most most of the time to make a good Roald Dahl. Uh, based movie you have to radically change the source material yeah there's there's <laughs> been like three roll doll adaptations i really like Willy wonka and the chocolate factory fantastic mr fox and matilda yeah yeah i would tend to agree with that but i do think those other two are on a much better level than this one i was about to say the witches is actually fairly book accurate and it sucks <laughs> we did it we did an episode on it uh but i gave i gave it four stars it's very fun and the direction is actually doing a lot of really fun things yeah. the cast is great it's <laughs> funny it's engaging the lighting's good like I, I don't know it's a good movie yeah i wanted to mention uh <laughs> In my review, I said it has a similar uh, visual dictionary to The Quick and the Dead, <laughs> which uh, I, I, that really speaks volumes about uh, what how this movie is. It's, right. it's a lot of fun. Good stuff. I uh, gave it a four and a half. Then on the 20th the and 20th. or the 21st, uh, we watched Knives Out. <laughs> Knives Out. Uh, very, very good. I've talked about it several times. We, we did, did an episode on it. We did an episode about it. This was my 18th time logging it on Letterboxd, <laughs> uh, and I still gave it five stars. I This was my seventh time watching it, and I, I, I the past couple times it's finally beaten me down. I've, I've, <laughs> given, I've given it a five the yes. past few times. It's, yes. good. it's a good movie. <laughs> I love Ryan Johnson too much, I think. <laughs> Uh, then on the 21st, I watched uh, Original Cast Album Company. Nice. Um, a very cool little documentary. It's nice, short. You get to see uh, Stephen Sondheim <laughs> in a turtleneck. <laughs> uh, it, uh, yeah, it's just very good, very well made. Stephen Sondheim as, in a turtleneck. <laughs> as, a theater, as a theater person myself, it was very fun to watch. Uh, I go. gave it four and a half. Not too shabby. Then on the 21st, we watched... Uh, we went out to the theater, and we watched The Lost City. The Lost new, City. New, new film, <laughs> if you could even believe it. And you know... It's it good. Was, it was... Yeah, it was good. A great was, even, I would uh, no, argue. No, no. I would I wouldn't, I wouldn't say great. <laughs> I would argue. <laughs> Robbie's, Robbie's throwing these great labels out like, wow. they're, like they're candy on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, but yes, The Lost City. Um, I don't know. You If you're... A movie person you've probably seen a trailer or two for it i yeah. imagine and it's kind of what you would expect from a weird goofy comedy yeah thing with sandra How bullock to describe it really <laughs> channing tatum so if you ever have what is that movie called the the um the movie on netflix with the guy writing a book um oh true memoirs of an international assassin is that yeah it? yeah true okay. memoirs of an if you've ever seen that movie this is like that 
but much better. But much better. I was about to say, that movie kind of sucks, but uh, this is good. This is that, but actually pulling off a lot of its bits really well. Yeah. Man, um, Channing Tatum is really funny in this. Channing Tatum is as great in this. Um, honestly, the highlight, which is kind of weird, because yeah. I'm not a big Channing Tatum fan. Really? Daniel Radcliffe's really oh. fun. Brad Pitt's really fun. Like, Brad Pitt is a lot of fun in this. I'm glad I'm glad he got another role where he was able to eat a lot on screen. <laughs> Dude, why is he always eating? <laughs> what is going on with Brad Pitt? <laughs> he's, always, he's always eating something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I gave it three and a half. It's it's a it's a pretty good movie actually. Um, I mentioned that it, some of the jokes miss and it can feel it, it can feel really uh, scattered and repetitive a lot of the time. Yeah, its editing isn't very good. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the performances and pacing of it are are quite good. I, I like it a lot. Yeah. I gave it a four out of five. Uh, then on the twenty first, I watched Eraserhead. Eraserhead. Um, Ooh, we got a real art, art film on our hands, ladies and gentlemen. I still I still don't fully know how I feel about it, because I guess I still don't fully understand what it's trying to go mm, for Yeah. In, in a lot of ways. And every time I kind of think I do, I don't, which is kind of a staple of David Lynch stuff, I guess. Yeah. But I just don't know if I like it or not, you know? Fair enough. I, I like it a lot. It's one personally. of the few movies that really grosses me out, too. So <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, but I gave it a four and a half. It's it's really well crafted. Its atmosphere is insane. Mm. Uh, so many. There, there's just so much that's really great about this movie. Namely, uh, the Eraserhead Baby. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the Eraserhead it could baby. just it could just be like a two hour shot of just the Eraserhead Baby <laughs> chilling. And I would I would love it. Rappy, the Eraserhead Baby. <laughs> not only makes everybody go insane it ruins like it ruins his marriage and then his sex life after his marriage so it's pretty good a good movie i dare say <laughs> Yeah. Uh, weird movie, but yeah, good. Dude, the Four sound, the sound the eraser head baby makes is so good. Dude, I don't know how they got that <laughs> eraser head baby puppet to do some of the things it does. So good. like at one time, it's spitting up baby food and like it has a little tongue <laughs> and it's like spit. I don't know how they did it's, that. The puppet is so wet all the time. It's always slimy. <laughs> yeah, it's very impressive. <laughs> this and that was David Lynch's debut feature, right? Really? I'm pretty sure. Seventy-seven. Let's Unless see. I'm mistaken. Length. Feature sort by earliest first. Well, I didn't know his first. Yeah, yeah, that was his wow. debut. He did this. And imagine, <laughs> imagine coming out of the gate with something as weird as a racer. Dude, he did. He did a racer head, and then Elephant Man. Somehow, he got Dune, <laughs> and then Blue Velvet. That it's was so that was how weird. he kicked off. Everything. It's so weird. Shout out to David Lynch, I guess. Weirdest career, man. Legend from the start. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, some good movies. Yeah. Uh, and then this morning we woke up at like five o'clock and <sighs> w turned on uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, which is why we sound so incoherent right. for, for a lot of this, <laughs> this podcast. This, happen this happens every time we wake up super early <laughs> and we get to the podcast and we're like, mm, um, uh, I think it's monkey, <laughs> monkey, <laughs> monkey movie good. <laughs> We've been up for like almost five hours already and uh, that's insane my blood sugar it's falling it's, <laughs> i'm dying but thank you guys for listening uh pro no podcast next week probably maybe maybe i don't know i don't know depends how it we'll goes see. we'll see uh because i'm i'm going on a work trip Ooh, work trip mm, mr fancy, fancy. pants <laughs> yeah i have a feeling the problem the the, the Part of the reason we feel like this is we had my graduation party like two years late, obviously. I, I mean, I don't know if people keep up with my personal life, <laughs> but we had my graduation party yesterday and we, I think everyone ate way too much sugar. Oh man, I was, I crashed so I felt hard. so sick to my stomach yesterday. <laughs> that was rough. Yeah, but yeah. Um, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Uh, I don't know what movie we're going to be doing. Who knows when we'll return? It could be next week. It could week. be any time, could... but eventually we'll do War of the Planet of the Apes, so don't, yes. don't worry. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you for listening, and good night. <laughs> or good morning. I don't know. I don't know when people listen. Well, we put it out in the afternoon. <laughs> okay, so good afternoon. More likely, likely to listen to it at night. Thank you for listening. If not the next day. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>